All right. All right, so you guys see, just let me get rid of this. And all right, do you guys see it? It's good. Okay, so my name is Peter Banta and this is my capstone presentation on what determines a good NFL quarterback. Uh, this is an analysis of the top 10 quarterbacks taken in the last 10 NFL drafts in order to see what predictors could impact the performance of the player within the NFL. So this is just trying to determine if there's some sort of equation I can determine in order to predict how well a college quarterback will do once they enter the NFL. So the initial part of my project and the part of the project that probably took the most time just dear, due to how many data input values I had to do was collecting all the data from various sites on the internet. Uh, there was no master Excel spreadsheet or master spreadsheet that I could download that had all these values already. So I had to go through individually and put in every single player's stats, um, including what round they were taken in, what pick overall they were taken, um, what their average college yards were, what their NFL average yards were, if they've played any games, what year they were taken, and how many games they were starting in the NFL. Something that I added in halfway through the process was what conference that these players were coming from in order to see if there was some sort of discrepancy between the level of competition that these players were having during their college careers. Now for the college average yards, as well as the NFL average yards, I didn't know exactly how long each player was playing during games that they didn't start. So for example, if they were not the starting quarterback and just came in for maybe a quarter or two, that was weighted a little differently than a full game. So the equation that I came up with and the formula I used when I was creating these average totals was that each game that a player starts is one game and each game that they came in and played but didn't start was weighted as a third of a game so that it could be more fair toward those who were maybe not starters during their times uh, in college or in the NFL. Some players also had data values for games that maybe they were a freshman and just trying to get some time playing but weren't really the starter. I just took out those years because they got maybe 200 yards over the course of the entire year but were playing in like six games. So it wasn't really fair to weight those in their average yards because it wasn't really quality playing time for them. When I was going into my analysis, I had numerous factors that I was looking at. And the factors are the different predictors that I might use in order to try and create the formulas for how good a player might do. Numerical factors are just factors that have to do with whole numbers. So what round they're in, one through seven, what pick they are, one through 300, uh, and how many average yards per game they were getting. A categorical factor would be something like a name or what college conference they played in but I ended up excluding the name because each player has their own unique entry for that. And it wouldn't really uh, have any sort of impact towards my equations that I ended up coming up with. The responses is, if you can think of it in a mathematical term, the Y values. So if I'm trying to make equations, it would be the Y value that I'm making. Um, so this would be the average NFL yards they get, as well as a whole NFL game started that they have as a player. Once I plugged all my data from Excel into a software called Minitab, I used a regression equation calculator to make equations based on what conference the players played in, as well as it comes up for coefficients for the different factors that I had plugged in. So if you look closely at the image on the left side, it's sorting by what conference that the players came from with big names like the ACC, the Big Ten, the independent conference for some players who were playing during COVID, um, the Pac-12 and the SEC were all major players within the college football scene. Each equation tries to calculate how many average yards a player is going to get based on how well they do in college, as well as what pick they are taken within the NFL draft. It also correlates a Y-intercept value for each conference 
that is kind of like a baseline starting point for each player based on what conference they come from. So a higher value is usually better, but again, it depends on the data. The coefficients mean what that correlation value does based on how further back you're picked in the draft, as well as how well you do in college. So if you look, the pick value has a negative 0.777 value, meaning that the further away you are from the first pick, your number of yards you get during your NFL career goes down statistically a lot. So each pick you are past one goes down 0.777 yards on average during your career. The interesting he thing here is that average yards actually goes down the better you do in college, not up. So if you have more yards, you're actually doing worse on average during the NFL. A definitely an interesting thing to find when I made these equations. Now, looking at the past slide, you might think that makes no sense. You would think the better that you do in the college career, you would do better in the NFL. Well, due to this analysis of variance, I can see what factors that I looked at were actually statistically relevant to my equations. The important column within this image that you see is the p-value column all the way on the right side. We are looking for values that are less than 0.05 in order to determine if they are statistically relevant for my data. And as you can see, the only thing that was actually relevant was my picks. So high, how, you're, how high you are picked within the NFL draft is the only thing that can statistically predict how well you're going to do in the NFL. This kind of makes sense given that NFL scouts and coaches and general managers take years and years of college football data and film and look at it to analyze how well they think a prospect is going to do with the NFL. So the higher you're taken, the more they think you're good, and the better you're probably going to do. So this was kind of the uh, idea I came into this project with, and it did get proven throughout my analysis. This also is true for how many games starting in the NFL it is. However, this also had a caveat with it that I'm going to explain later. Visually, it became very interesting to see how much of a fall off there was between higher ranked picks and later round picks. Here you can see on this graph that I have rounds one through seven of the NFL draft plotted in different colors and shapes that show how many average yards a player was getting during their career. Some players did have zero because they have yet to play. And as such, you can see them all the way down at the bottom. However, this was still players that just weren't good enough to make a team and just never played for whatever team had drafted them and they were soon cut. As you can see, the tighter groupings of first and second rounds mean that statistically, it's more consistent that you do better in the first couple rounds. They're going to be pretty good for you. And in the first round, you can see there's a couple of home run quarterbacks who have just been completely at odds with everyone else in their group, that they're just better than everyone else. However, there are still mishaps. You can see some in the first and second round that never played. One comes to mind that comes out of the Oakland Raiders was EJ Manuel, who was taken really high in the draft, but ended up being a complete bust. After the second round, you can see that how consistent the picks are drops off significantly. From the third all the way to the seventh round, you're basically just shooting fish in a barrel and you don't know what you're gonna get when you take them as high as you do. You're hoping, and they could be good, but you just don't know. They could have anywhere from zero to about 275 to 300 yards on their career. But the thing is, is that you just don't know. As you can see from the last 10 years, only one quarterback taken in the seventh round even got uh, significant play time within their career. Uh, this was someone known as Trevor Simeon, who is still a backup within the NFL. This is looking at the number of games that a player is starting. And this is the caveat I was talking about earlier. With how much resources are put into taking a player higher in the draft, teams tend to fall back on a sunk cost policy where they try to get value out of something that they put so much into. So you can see a large number of these players 
played anywhere between 10 to 45, 50 ish games before they were done in their career. This could be anywhere from one to three seasons before a team maybe thinks it's time to move on from that quarterback, as well as a large number of first round picks who are still playing and have played large numbers of seasons and games for their teams. Further on down the graph, you can see that the consistency of players getting playtime drops off again significantly. But the second round does have more gems than you would think. They're getting a lot of playtime, given how many players were taken in this range. You can see that the second highest value on this graph was actually a second round pick, and the highest value was a third round pick, uh, showing that it still is kind of shooting fish in a barrel for what you're going to get, given how high you take a player within these drafts. Overall, the trend for players is that you will get more playtime the higher you're taken. However, you can see that it's not really as consistent as you would think it would be, given how high some players are taken. This was the good part, trying to look for what players broke the mold of where they were taken. This graph, while incredibly hard to read, does show what players kind of stood out to the software as it was doing its analysis and trying to make these equations. Some of them understandably make sense. It's players with zero yards total. Either they haven't started yet because they were just taken in the 2020 draft, or they just weren't good enough and never got play time. And that doesn't make sense to the software as it doesn't know what kind of data it's looking at, just trying to make sense of the data. Some of these players, that did either far better or far worse than what they were predicted to do were Gardner Minshew, who is currently still in contention for a starting quarterback job. He was taking the 2019 draft in the sixth round. So he was definitely just a diamond in the rough. Uh, an interesting one was Deshaun Kaiser, which you can see as observation number 34 on the graph to the left. Uh, he did exactly as predicted. The equations were predicting he would get 221.2 yards on his career and he actually did get that based on the information that i was able to input into this so the equations did predict that perfectly well dak prescott the starting quarterback for the dallas cowboys was a fourth round pick in the 2016 draft and he has been phenomenal for what round he was taken in as well as an individual i already mentioned trevor simeon who is a 2015 seventh rounder who has done phenomenally well for where he was taken in the draft. Anomalies for how many games played also has the same problem as the first one, that if a player never got playtime, the software would mark them as an anomaly. But we can go through and sift through this to see what is different about these players than the normal. Some near the top of my uh, table here are players that haven't yet to play from the 2020 draft. Deshaun Kaiser, again, did exactly as predicted, predicted to start 15 games and did start 15. And an interesting thing to note was that the 2012 draft class of Ryan Tannehill, Russell Wilson, and Kirk Cousins are all still starting quarterbacks in the NFL and all came from one draft class, all starting above 100 games in their career so far as well as the 2011 draft with Cam Newton taken as the first overall and Andy Dalton taken second, both still potentially starting quarterbacks within the NFL who were just eons above those others in their draft class. Conclusions coming from this and things that I learned from this project was that obviously higher drafted players are going to do better. This was the understanding I came into this project with, and it was proven through my analysis. It makes sense that an NFL team would take time and thought and effort and put those into their draft picks in order to get the best quarterback that they can. What was surprising to me is that conferences don't matter at all. Something that's talked about a lot within the NFL is strength of competition. And some conferences in college are just not created equal. Some are better. SEC, for example, has tons of players getting taken out of those conferences every year. They've had more than 10 players picked in drafts, more than any other conference in the college uh, football scene.
but it doesn't matter for quarterbacks. Potentially, maybe the quarterbacks don't need to try as hard because they have better players around them. Or some players in lesser conferences have to show off more in order to get picked. I don't know, but the analysis proved that it didn't matter as much as I thought it would. Another interesting one is that it doesn't matter as much how well you do in college. Maybe, just like I said, lesser conference quarterbacks have to do better and show off more and get higher stats in order to get picked. And maybe better conference quarterbacks don't need to do as well and they're getting less stats, but they're still better quarterbacks than others. This is what I wanted to do when I go into the professional fields. And trying to do this for my senior capstone showed me a lot of what exactly I wanted to do with my life. And this did prove that this is exactly the path I wanted to go down. Finally, I got to do a project in college that really played exactly into what I was passionate about, which was sports analysis. And this showed me that while I've learned a lot and what I've been able to apply to this project is significant for what I wanna do, there's so much more that I wanna learn and there's so much more that I think I can do within this field. Thank you. Meg, I think, do you want to go first? Uh, I have a couple of questions, but if you want to go first, uh, go ahead. Um, so, Peter, I thought that was really interesting. Um, talk to us a little bit about what you want to do in the application of something like this specifically. Is it, can it be used across, um, you know, all sports? Is it, could it be used, for instance, in Division One recruiting? Uh, yeah, for yeah. So athletes? this is, this is something that, got me on this track. I transferred out of just a pure game design track in RIT and transferred into SOIS um, in order to go into data analysis as my mixture. Um, I was inspired by a movie called Moneyball um, that kind of showed how big analysis could impact baseball, actually. Um, and that was the first sport that really used it as much as it is prevalent today. So this kind of analysis and big data is used across pretty much every sport now in order to get just that slight edge above other competition. So hopefully I can apply this to any sport that I would want to go into. Okay. And, um, and what, kinds of, um, what kinds of jobs would you be looking at? Are you looking at, um, well, I guess, what's the range? I think it's actually probably pretty wide. Yeah, it's incredibly wide. So I could do anything within sports analysis um, that can be from maybe working at a news station trying to get stats for them or working for a professional sports team or working for big organizations like maybe the NFL or the MLB. Um, this sort of big analysis could also be taken in a totally different direction with finance or business or marketing, um, all of which I've, I've taken classes with in my time here at RIT just to see if, you know, maybe that's another path that I wanted to go down. Um, so my range is actually huge. So my options are a lot and I don't know. <laughs> that's great. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. So, so Peter, let me pretend to be um, um, a hiring manager for some NFL team. I guess it doesn't have to be football, but since your project is NFL, let's say NFL. And you come into my office and, and you talk about this project. And I say to you, okay, you've told me, uh, based on, on your research, the, the factors that don't matter, but I didn't really hear much about the factors that do matter. So, so how would you respond to that? What I proved in proving that something doesn't matter is just as important at proving that it does matter because you can spend your resources in different ways. Uh, time is money. And for NFL teams that are preparing for this week is the NFL draft. Time is everything right now. And you're trying to prepare to make the best choice that you possibly can because this is your team's future. And based on my analysis, you should not really be putting as much attention to what conference they're coming from or potentially how well they did in the college career. Let's look at, you know, the intangibles. Are your scouts looking at them and saying, yes, this is a high pick player? Because if that's true, they're probably going to do better. And 
proving that something doesn't matter helps an NFL team to get that edge that, you know, they're all looking for. Everyone's seeking for that Super Bowl. And if you can get there just by the skin of your teeth, well, it's still a Super Bowl for you. Okay. Okay. I, I, I completely see the point that, you know, there's only so much you can pay attention to, especially something that's time sensitive. So, so talking about the, or, or identifying the factors that matter less is, is obviously going to be helpful. Um, but, but still in all, you know, you've based your data on, on, on what's already happened. Yes. And you've discovered that players who, for the most part, and of course, there's always outliers, which, which is right. the trick, I guess, right? Right. But for the most part, players that happen to get picked uh, in the first round, indeed, you know, they prove to be value for money. They, they prove that whoever picked them did the right thing. Right. But still, you know, I still want to know, well, what what about that player caused that team to 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 pick him? So you know, I I, I don't know whether you you mentioned intangibles, and and I don't know whether you know a follow on study from what you've done to focus on you know in the, in the positive what positive factors um, uh, scouts should look at. I don't know whether that's a viable possible study. I, I love that you brought that up because doing this actually did make me want to continue this project further. And I wish I had more time to actually present more that I had found and be able to go back and add more factors in, see if there was bigger data that I could look at, like um, type of offense, type of coaching style. Uh, is there some sort of correlation between, um, you know, coaches that got go with these players throughout their entire career? Um, are some just better um, just to see you know what the predictors could be like could I make that you know golden equation um, that would be able to just say yep they're going to get this this many yards in their career please don't pick them like they are not the future um, don't do this to us um, like I, I know you had brought up um, when we were talking at the beginning of this project that um, your football club had made a couple of signings that you were just like please no, like stop, um, you know, trying to make that equation that would tell them that is a horrible idea. Don't do that. Um, or maybe that's a brilliant idea and no one else has seen it. Let's do it. And we're going to, you know, go all the way now. So um, being able to continue, this would be amazing. If, if you were able to do that, I can see lots of millions of dollars. Oh yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. G great presentation. And now I'll open it up to anybody else who, 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 has, who has questions. Perhaps David. Yes, I uh, have a couple of comments and, and uh, I, first of all, let me apologize. We're having a lot of work done here and our, we lost our power in the middle of your presentation. So I got kicked out. I got back in right at the end. So I, I missed uh, most of what you presented, Peter, but, um, but I must say, I, I, I find the topic really interesting and, and uh, you know, um, may actually like to touch base with you just to learn a little bit more about the part that I did miss and uh, um, kind of learn a little bit more about what you did. The, uh, you know, much of what you're, you've done extends to many areas and and this kind of analysis you know this this whole concept of big data and you know it's not unlike an institution of higher education trying to take um, incoming students and take their their pre-college data to try to predict which students are going to be most at risk of graduating uh, or you know which ones are better are, are more prepared for graduation etc um, so that kind of analysis that, that you're doing in, in terms of predictive analytics extends to many areas right now. So it's a, it's a great, great opportunity. Um, I know you used kind of a multivariable regression analysis in, in your approach. Do you know, is that the approach that's typically done uh, with uh, player performance analysis in the sports industry? Or do they use other air, other other types of methodologies? Like you know, there's all sorts of machine learning algorithms and neural networks and random forest uh, approaches. Do, do you know anything about that? 
Yeah, I actually looked at a, a number of studies in my course of trying to make this uh, capstone project just to see what had been done, because this has been, been a question for years and decades of, you know, how how can we predict the next like Tom Brady, for example, like how do we how do we find that? Um, and there has been all sorts of, you know, attempts at all sorts of, of things like you mentioned, um, like AI and uh, neural networks. Um, which is more of a more recent thing. And people are like, maybe that'll be the future. Um, this is the path I chose. Um, it had been used before in different ways, uh, but it's the path I was most familiar with just due to my courses of study here at RIT um, that I was more comfortable doing it. And I was more able to analyze the results that would make sense. Um, my biggest fear would be I would choose something that I wasn't as familiar with, get my results and be like, now what? I don't know what this means. Um, I did it. It's great, but I can't interpret it, which is the whole thing. Um, so while it had been uh, done before, it, it was something I was confident with, as well as my ability to interpret those results. Yeah, I, I, I think in terms of regression analysis, that's that's really the classic place to start. So yeah. I, I think you're right on the money there. Um, and and as, as you branch out into this, I think learning a little bit about neural networks and some of the other machine learning algorithms will really, um, you know, put you in a, a position of being able to, to do an awful lot uh, with, with predictive analytics. So, so well, thank you. Before we, we go on um, to Kevin, uh, the one point which is perhaps a little, mm, I don't know, I don't want to say a scientific, but something, as long as David's extended this to the field of higher education, you know, we get a lot of students, I've seen a lot of students come in and, you know, first impressions and all, and you think, oh my God, how on earth did that student make it to RIT? And three or four years later, there's the same student walking across the stage collecting their baccalaureate degree. And you know, but we make decisions oftentimes without regard for the likelihood of outliers because you can't identify them ahead of time, right? That's the problem. But those, you know, those little uh, symbols that you had showing, uh, I think the, the top two performers were not taken in the first, uh, first round as you, as you think, as you go forward with this sort of analysis, I hope that you will never forget the possibility of the outliers because, you know, that cuts off a whole bunch of opportunity to people who, who could succeed if they were given the opportunity. So I think, you know, it's, it, it's hard to, you can't predict it. You, you just don't know, but it's yeah. important not to forget about them. Yeah, I think the, the most important thing with this sort of analysis is not to forget about the human factor. Um, right. which is probably the most important one and that it really does show that you can never predict what someone can do. So right. that, that was kind of what I found and it's great. Great. Thank you very much, Peter. It was a great presentation. So let's now go to Kevin. All right. Um, let me share my screen now. Um, let's see if I can full screen this. That should be fine. Oh, sorry. Hold on. There we go. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. That was awesome. Uh, I hope I, I don't know whether I'm an outlier yet. <laughs> um, I'm somewhere on that. On that. Um, why did we let him into RIT spectrum? So, um, but thank you guys. Uh, I'm excited to show you guys my capstone. Uh, it is the formula to a viral internet show. My background is in business and marketing and advertising, and I have a, a associates in film and TV. Um, and my goal is with this capstone is to create a formula for the modern day viral videos um, or for the videos altogether. It's cr create a formula that I can apply to, you know, one channel to one, um, one uh, yeah, I guess you could say channel of content and, uh, and have it grow as quick as possible and be able to replicate that to any other genre um, for a, another uh, uh, channel that I wanted to create. Um, but I think it all starts with digital entertainment. Um, and right now, 
it influences billions of people's lives every day. I'm sure every person on this call um, with an amount of demand that's nearly equal to the amount of supply uh, of people craving digital entertainment, YouTube boasts 31 million channels are being made every year. There's like so much content out there for you to consume. You don't really know you know, what's good and what's not good. There's so much competition fighting for your eyeballs and the ones that get you to watch and can keep you captivated, the reward for those channels and those creators and entertainers is, is huge. Um, so only a select few of the people that live, uh, the creators that live on these platforms have been seen by the masses. We know, I think we all have our own select creators that we watch that not a lot of people know about, but then there's ones that we all know are common threads um, and they have massive influence, nearly rivaling the, the ratings of traditional television by, by far margins. They heavily influence pop culture and that's really what I wanted to study. I wanted to study those creators, those shows, those platforms. How do you build one and how do you build one intentionally so that you could maximize your viewership potential super quickly and replicate the formula over and over to other genres. Uh, so I started simply by surveying my audience, my friends. Uh, I knew some of the requirements that I wanted to set for myself. I knew that the audience that I wanted to, uh, to be a fan of my show would be within 18 to 30 year, uh, year range. Um, I knew that I just resource wise needed a dedicated set I didn't want to have to move um, to different locations to shoot the content that I wanted to make. Uh, another point is that I think collaborative or highly collaborative content is really popular right now um, because it's really brand friendly and really sponsor friendly. So I needed my show to be driven by guests, not by a singular host like um, a David Letterman or a, a Trevor Noah, um, because that right now with the resources that I have would make it sustainable enough and palatable enough for me to attract sponsors and deals and maybe uh, grow and, and, and create another show that had a host. But those are requirements that I set for myself. So I, I'll put this survey to my friends and to my audience, just simply asking them, what do you watch online? I wanna know. And I got about 68 different show responses. Um, they spanned multiple different genres and subscriber counts all on YouTube. And I put them into a spreadsheet um, and I began to categorize and try to start to quantify the popular trend, trends amongst these shows. So there's a lot here to unpack. Um, and this is only maybe a third of the shows that are on there. Um, but it, it was a good starting point. I set the categories, which you can see at the top, dedicated set sponsors and then host involvement um, and then try to quantify the emotional experience that the audience member would receive watching the show. From there, uh, if you look to the column all the way to the left, I mean all the way to the right, excuse me, with the red, green, and yellow, I tallied them up and I basically said if they tick all these boxes, I want to see, you know, yellow. That's that's a, a level two of you know the content that I'm looking to replicate. If they tick all the boxes, I want a level three. Um, if they tick you know, not enough boxes, then I don't really wanna look at those shows. So I want to focus your attention to those, these three categories on the screen. The first red circle is the categories that I required. These are, uh, there's more categories here collapsed, but you're only seeing the important ones. Um, the second category, is the one that I mentioned where I categorized all the scores amongst the categories collapsed and not collapsed to find how many of these boxes these shows tick and two that are highlighted in lime green really stood out, which is Fly House and Dad Jokes uh, created by Alt Def Digital. Um, Fly House, for those who don't know, is a TikTok show where influencers go on and do fun challenges with each other. Uh, and Dad Jokes, ran by Alt Def Digital, 
is a show where two comedians compete to make each other laugh with the corniest one-liner dad jokes. So these were the two shows that I knew I need to replicate the most. And the purple column that you see is the emotional experience evoked by the, uh, the show. And both of these hit the entertainment category, the fun um, comedic category. So I knew that that was probably a basis to start. Um, I, I needed to start with comedy. Um, so with that formula, I was able to narrow it down to those two shows. And I added in the other 16 that filled this yellow, almost perfect, but not so perfect category. And I began to broke, break them down even further to try to quantify more common themes or self, surface level tactics that were being used by each channel and show. These included things like analyzing the thumbnails of the videos, the copywriting techniques on their, on their titles, their posting frequency, the channel sentiment in the comment section and more. And this is what I kind of found. Quantifiably, all of these channels post about one video every four and a half days. I noticed that with Alt Death Digital, they have more content than just their dad joke series, but that specific series and actually every series on their channel airs every four days. So they're still following the same, uh, the same technique of posting one video to that series every four and a half days. Both. All of the channels feature a human in a thumbnail. There's a, there's a natural quality for humans to attract to you know, eyes and faces. And they take advantage of this, as you can see on the right, um, of showing humans in the thumbnail and getting people to see faces. Um, these ones have more prominent figures, uh, if you know who they are um, on these channels, but still the human element is, is uh, natively a part of it. I, I found that in looking at TikTok versus YouTube, Flyhouse is actually a TikTok show. They do really well on TikTok, but they don't do as great on YouTube. And I think it's because of a formatting problem. They try to keep the native format of TikTok and transfer it to YouTube when I think the audience on YouTube is are used to our horizontal format. So I uh, quanti uh, quantitatively, the content that I need to make needs to remain within the format that is going to be shipped. If I'm going to make content um, for YouTube and TikTok, I need to make separate, I need to um, format it separately for each channel. And then the thumbnail needs to convey the video theme immediately. Um, you need to immediately grasp exactly what you think you're gonna be watching. And dad jokes, if you look at those thumbnails, people are laughing. You, you automatically are set in the, the tone that you're gonna watch a funny video that's gonna be exciting. I think the same kind of goes for uh, Flyhouse and their thumbnails, but they're having more of a friendly um, atmosphere. And I think that's kind of what they're going for. So qualitatively, taking a deeper dive into those two shows and the 16 other shows, I started to really understand what creators were doing and what techniques they were employing to keep their audience member as long as possible uh, and to maximize the emotional experience they were trying to evoke out of the audience member. A lot of studies that I found talked about length of video and I really found that it doesn't really matter as long as the segments within the video are broken up to keep the audience member engaged and the momentum uh, either escalating or keep at the same uh, the same level. Out of all the 16 plus the two shows that I found, comedy is by far the biggest genre. So again, I think that's the one that I wanted to focus on the most. Um, and I think the audience members in these uh, shows, as I go into the comment section, enjoy living vicariously through the creators. A lot of the shows that I found were all kind of in comp uh, creating a competition-esque element. And people love that. As you can see by Pat Cloud in his comment, um, and this one was about the dad jokes videos, that there's no prize on the line, but they're still competing and he still finds it you know, quite hilarious. So there's an element of almost voyeurism um, to be had if you can create intentionally 
and have your audience member uh, really feel like they're living through these characters that are participating in their in these challenges. Kevin, so from there, I, Kevin, can yeah. I just interrupt and say, can you wrap up in the next three minutes or so? Yep, I can. Oh, I'm at my last slide right now, actually. Um, so I think for me, the formula is fairly simple. Um, right now, this formula is 2021 dated. It, it could change, but I think funny content mixed with human focused thumbnails and segments under a minute plus the consistency of posting a video every four days is going to make any channel, no matter what the genre, viral. Um, funny content, I think, is probably going to be the most, uh, is, is the genre for maximum viewership potential right now. But I think this formula can and basically can span any, any genre. Um, and, and that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. A lot, a lot to uh, think about in, 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 as a result of what you've just said. Um, one technical question, you know, when, when you do a survey, you, the most, perhaps the most important factor, certainly the, one of the most important is, is who you're asking. So you, you said, you, you set up your uh, uh, initial um, uh, selection of, of, of shows based on your friends, you said. So my, my first question is, First of all, how many people, how, not how many friends do you have, but who all responded? And yeah. were they, were they, uh, the, you know, were they a cross section of, of people, of, of, of viewers of, of these sorts of shows? So if I posted it on all my different social media. I think I got in total about 150 responses. Um, um, no, and good. some of them were the same. And then some of, I automatically knew that some of the channels did not fit the study that I wanted to do, um, whether it was like vlogging or um, th just the content that they were referring me to or like music, it, it just wouldn't fit the, the style that I knew I needed to create. Um, so I kind of ruled a, a decent amount out. Um, and then there was a little bit of overlap, but not too much. I, I think I, that it's good that you got, got that many. That's great. I, I think when we originally, when you originally pitched this project to me, mm -hmm. you were you were pretty much focused on TikTok, if I remember. Yeah. So, but now you 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 apparently have done sort of some sort of contrast between YouTube and TikTok. Can you talk about how that evolved? Yeah. So, uh, TikTok was my main focus, and it actually still is. I think when I did the study, I wanted to look at YouTube because YouTube is the king of more long form content and more uh, narrative driven content. And I knew that that was where my focus would need, it uh, is where I wanted it to be because of my background. So I wanted to look at that and then figure out how I could replicate the success to be found on YouTube in a smaller format like TikTok. Um, so it was looking at that and really being like, okay, this is what I need to work with now for TikTok. I'll just need to like really shrink it down a lot. Like the same formula can work. I just need to either make the segments smaller, um, still, you know, uh, the themes of momentum and, and keeping the audience engaged and things like, uh, similar threads are the same, but YouTube was really going to, was like, uh, my, almost like my, my, uh, control. Like I, I needed to get that one down because I knew that would be super important. And then for um, like uh, production purposes, I knew that um, that I would make content for both. You, uh, TikTok would probably be supplemental to a YouTube video, which would be more longer form. Um, so TikTok would grasp, grab the audience member and then direct them to YouTube where they can watch the, the longer form content. I see. I see. Okay. All right. Great presentation. Uh, let me hand it over to Meg. And I thought that was so interesting. And, um, you know, as someone who is outside the 18 to 30 demographic, I was frantically searching for something that I would recognize <laughs> the list of all of those shows. And I didn't come up with a single thing, um, but that's neither here nor there. No, um, <laughs> I, you know, as someone that gets reminders of how much time I'm spending on my phone these days, um, I'm really interested in your thoughts on this particular moment in time 
So, and I wonder how you think, um, how you think COVID has impacted all of this and maybe our need for comedy and will this change once mm. we're, we're past this moment? Um, and, and I know that that probably wasn't part of your project. I'd just be interested in your thoughts and, and are we going to be spending as much time on TikTok as my 13 year old is um, mm. or out of this particular moment in time? I think, so the trend has shown that um, like the consumption of online or like video content, ha and I know I only have a couple of minutes, um, has gone up over the last couple of years. I think with COVID, it's going to reset it a little bit. I don't think we're, when COVID is all said and done, I think it'll take a, a, a sharp dip and, um, and, and we'll enjoy the outdoors for a little bit. Um, but I think it's going to go right back to where it is. Uh, I don't think that people are going to totally rule it out their lives. They're just going to consume a little bit less as they try to get back the time that they feel that they lost. I agree with you. All right. Really good job. Thank you. I have a question. I have, I have, oh, let me yeah. turn my video on. I do have, um, is my video on? Yeah, I do have work going yeah. on in the house. So it's going to be loud and crazy. But um, my, so, I, and I'm outside of, your demographic and I think and just like um what Meg was saying I actually um so like when I think about you know the content that I that I watch on YouTube none of it is funny <laughs> um but so I, I I wonder if you you know maybe an, another study right would be you um take a larger demographic um of people maybe outside of the, you know, the 18 to 30 and see um, what are those things that people are watching? Um, like, like, I, like, I, like my mom what follows folks on YouTube and it's all political. I follow people on YouTube and it's all about handbags, <laughs> shopping. You're right. Um, there's actually a Mintel study that I read um, just be, it got released at the beginning of this year that says actually within an older, older um, demographic, which I mean, I, I'm getting there, I'm nearly there, um, that uh, it's more, the two biggest categories right now in the world is entertainment and edu educational uh, content. So in, in my professional opinion, I think anyone is consuming a healthy dose of both. Um, and I think as the older you get, it might be more edutainment. You might watch things that more educate you but have a, a degree of entertainment value. Um, and then when you're younger, you have, your content is more skewed toward, you know, uh, share education, I mean, share entertainment value based content um, with a, a healthy dose of edutainment stuff. Um, but it, it could be any mix of those two. And do you feel like that's what it is? Like you watch a lot of handbag videos to see like what, what you want to get or, you know, what's new and oh, totally. things like that? Totally. Yeah. And I also think about my sister too, who wants to try to like um, gain momentum on YouTube and her mm -hmm. videos are mostly on like um, finances and, and, you know, um, and things like that. And she's just not getting the momentum that, you mm -hmm. know, she would like. And um, so I'll, I'll actually share your findings with her, and you know, cause yeah. she's a funny person. So, but maybe if there's a mix sure. of that. Yeah. I, I'm a talent manager. Uh, I'm trying to grow my company as a talent manager. So I'd love to connect and, and give her some tips or whatever. And I'll be down for that. Okay, Kevin, thanks very much. Uh, we, we have no more time for any more questions because uh, otherwise Bria will begin to think that uh, we've forgotten that there's a third uh, presenter. So Bria, thanks very much, Kevin. Great presentation. And Bria, are you ready? Uh, yeah, I'm good to go. Um, I will share my screen. Oh, uh, Kevin, can you stop sharing your screen for me? We'll let me. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, right. uh, let me expand this. And beginning. All right, so thank you so much guys uh, for having me today. And I hope I can follow up on those two wonderful presentations, we shall see. Um, but my presentation today is going to be on e-commerce and uh, you know how technological advancements have kind of changed the path of retail in recent years. 
Um, so I'm going to start off by giving a little bit of background on why I chose this project. So um, I am, you know, before I started my third year at RIT, I went all online uh, before it was cool. And I moved to Los Angeles and started working for an e-commerce company. Um, so that, you know, in my year and seven months there, I worked closely with a portion of the pet industry, actually, which is a very small market, um, and saw how it really changed their business entirely. So, you know, what is e-commerce? I'm sure we're all pretty familiar with it. We've probably done more than enough of it through the pandemic. Um, but simply, it's the buying and selling of goods on the internet. Um, you know, this has become increasingly popular as everyone has a cell phone, a laptop, a computer, multiple devices in the household. Um, you know, sorry. <laughs> um, there are plenty of companies today that offer e-commerce services to businesses to be able to uh, create an online presence. So think Shopify, Big Commerce. It's okay if you don't recognize either of those, but those are two very popular ones. They give you a customer facing website, a um, back, uh, back end management system for you and your employees, and then also just kind of various other things like payment processing. So usually it's a pre-made software, they have all those features, and then you can usually get your shop up and running in less than a week. So there are a few different kinds of transactions in e-commerce. The main one I'll be focusing on today is B2C transactions, which are business to end, um, end user customer. The other most common type is B2B, which is business to business. Um, for a B2C platform, there's a few things you need to cover. So that's, I kind of discussed that a little bit earlier, the customer shopping site, the backend management and the payment processor. Let's talk a little bit about how e-commerce has changed in the recent years. So according to the U.S. Census um, Bureau, the United States e-commerce generated $791.7 billion in sales in 2020. That's a 32.5% increase from 2019. Now we can attribute some of that to the fact that a lot of businesses were forced to go online in 2020 due to COVID-19, but it's still been on, the steady, been on a steady rise. Uh, since the early 2000s. So from, 2000, uh, to, from 2000 to about 2005, e-commerce only took up about 1% or less of the whole retail market. Um, but as the results came out from 2020, it's now up to 14% of the entire market. Uh, also, just another, you know, to kind of drive home how much we're really processing in, you know, home delivery. 41% of consumers uh, in a study done by Walker Sands Communication showed that they receive one to two packages a week from Amazon alone. That is no other retailer, that is just Amazon. And that kind of continues to rise as you look at various age groups, uh, 26 to 35 year olds being the worst offender at 57%. Um, I know in our household of two people, we see quite a few packages, so I'm not surprised. Um, so, you know, why put in the effort? What's the value? Simple. To be able to compete with large companies such as Amazon, Walmart, Target, you get the gist. Uh, small businesses have more competition than ever, and while shopping locally is great, it's not always the easiest if you don't have an online presence. So having that website and having your inventory listed allows people who are using a search engine online to see your website. Um, you know, think of like how Google Maps works where you type in something and it's like, oh, this store has it right here. It's three miles away. Um, especially with the pandemic, e-commerce boomed. And so businesses needed an avenue to sell and ship products while also offering, you know, same day in-store pickup. So going back to Amazon, since they are such a conglomerate in the e-commerce market, they offer prime delivery. They can get people stuff in two days. And if you live in a large city like New York City, sometimes they can be there the next day. So in order to kind of take those consumers back or even just have a share of that market, offering ordering online with same day pickup can have amazing results for your business. There are many valuable aspects to putting that. Uh, continuing with the valuable aspects, uh, think of social media engagement. Everybody has a phone. A lot of people at least have Facebook. You want to get your products out there, your promotional sales, your weekly highlights. And, you know, they can follow your store page. If you have 30 loyal followers because you're just a small little mom and pop shop, 
but they have 50 friends, you could be reaching up to 1500 people with one post if they share it. Um, another great uh, system for e-commerce uh, is being able to create customer accounts. So that's, you know, a customer shops on your site and instead of checking out as guest, it gives them the option to be a, re, you know, a reoccurring user and that can enter them into marketing campaigns for you. Um, so email campaigns are actually one of the most popular and I'm sure you get tons of emails in your inbox from places you've shopped. Um, but that would kind of be the preferred method. So uh, continuing with uh, my, uh, the Walker and Sands study, they found that 61% of consumers were uh, preferred to be contacted via email and only 25% preferred to be contacted through social media. Emails feel less pushy, less intrusive. It's more a nudge. It's not a direct, oh, I'm contacting you on your personal profile, which is why that can be a really safe avenue for businesses trying to build their clientele. Um, now that I've kind of discussed some of the background of general e-commerce, I want to kind of talk about what I specialized in, which was the pet industry. Uh, so the pet industry in the United States generated $103.6 billion in revenue in 2020. Um, this is up from $95.7 billion in 2019. Um, the growth is continuing on an upward trend. There's about 13,000 independent retailers right now just in the United States. And um, there's 136 million households that have one pet or more. And that ranges from dogs to cats to reptiles to exotics. Um, the market is continuing to grow. Um, and in the last seven years, U.S. households buying pet products um, on, uh, through e-commerce online shopping has increased by 274%, while retail stores have only increased by 30%. Um, this means kind of to stay afloat in this industry, it seems that they're going to have to move more to an online presence to compete with the large conglomerates that have entered the market. So one specific uh, e-commerce software, which is the company that I work for, is called Etail Pet, and we were for independent pet retailers. Uh, we are one of the only ones to specialize in the pet industry because it is such a small target market. Um, our CEO ran her own 14-store chain, and she did that for a few years before creating e-commerce for herself, then deciding to give it to the rest of the independent pet retailers and creating this company. Uh, you know, we offer everything I discussed earlier while also doing auto orders and drop shipping. Um, auto ordering is a huge part of any e-commerce market. So one, um, having an automated order system allows your customers to have a subscription. So, you know, it delivers on a weekly basis, it delivers on a monthly basis, and that kind of helps with customer retention and also just keeps, a, a, you know, a steady, a steady stream of income coming in each month. Um, so on the last slide, I had a company called Chewy that I had listed. Uh, they are an e-commerce only platform. So they don't have any physical stores. They are literally just a giant pet market on the internet. And two thirds of their revenue in 2019 was from auto order subscriptions. Um, and they have continued to grow, growing 47% in 2020. From the, I imagine part of that was from the pandemic. Um, since automated ordering has proved to be such a hit, we added that to our system as well to better um, equip these small independent retailers to compete with these larger, um, these larger chains. Uh, one chain in particular that we do have on our software is actually a 70 store chain who now do $500,000 a month in volume just in auto orders. That does not include the rest of their um, and if you look at it on a per location basis, that's about $7,000 per location. So another great feature about e-commerce is the partnerships that you can get from it. Um, so have you ever been on a manufacturer brand website and they, they say like, oh, you want to buy this product? Type in your zip code and we'll show you what, lo what closest stores have it so you can go pick it up. Um, one thing we were able to do was partner with some of the top food, pet food brands in the country to be able to get our clients on their store locators. Um, when it comes to our clientele, we only serve about 8% of the market, um, but we are opening up to more sections of the industry and we are only a two-year-old company. So 
Um, before I kind of get into some more metrics, I just wanted to let you guys know that all data has been anonymized to, um, you know, further discuss revenue generation and social media aspects of e-commerce. So you will see on the left in the first graph, I had 108 uh, samples I took from our online reporting and I divided them into groups to show how, um, you know, your average sales revenue goes up or down based on how long you've been on an e-commerce platform. Um, group A was our smallest group and they were also our one to three monthers. And then our largest group was actually group D, which um, is our 10 to 12 monthers. So they came on probably after the initial shutdowns of COVID-19 last year. Um, and then our longest, uh, our longest group is group B with 12 plus months. Um, and as you'll see from the average sales revenue each month, um, the people who have been on the longest are taking up about half of the chart because they just, um, they have built a great client base. Also included in there is a large chain. So that, um, you know, I did break it down on a per door. So they will have, um, you know, some of that broken up, but I didn't want it to skew my data too much. Um, you will also notice though, that group C is the seven to nine monthers, but they actually had less revenue than group B. Now that could be a ton of factors. Some people come on with a one store chain and they say, you know, oh, I only have like 10 people who are interested in online ordering. I'm just doing it for visibility. Okay, cool, like fantastic. But then you also have the people who have been waiting forever to get online, they finally do it and they immediately get a hundred orders in a month. Let's just see. Um, so you, I'm gonna go back really quick, sorry, prematurely skipped. Um, you may be thinking that revenue per month seems pretty low for a business. Like why would you have a business that only brings in $700 on e-commerce? Well, the pet industry is actually made up of quite a few mom and pop shops and it's almost 60% of them are uh, non-employers, which means they actually have no paid employees and 83% uh, of them have three or less paid employees. Usually they are family businesses and they're not in it for the profit. They usually care about, just care about animals. Um, that was something that was really interesting to me throughout my time working there is it's a very emotional investment compared to businesses that are just kind of in it to make money. Um, so after uh, kind of looking at their revenue, I wanted to go into the visibility aspect, which is another reason many companies are going online uh, and on social media. So I did, um, I kind of took customer feedback that we had received over my year there, and I went back and saw what their favorite features were. I'm not surprised, in-store pickup is the favored thing. That's what makes you money. It's a very straightforward, easy process, and you know it brings in customers. Um, auto order came in as a close second, and that is very popular among the multi-store chains because they usually have um, larger inventory to kind of deal with that. Some of the mom and pop shops usually stay away from auto ordering just in case um, that they can't handle the volume. Um, so I also took uh, the our social media management tools and I looked at the revenue based on social media activity. And I did see there was kind of a direct relationship it, up to a certain point that as you use social media engagement, sent out you know, uh, emails, made you know, three or four posts a week seemed to be the sweet spot. Uh, that seemed to increase their revenue. However, it does seem to plateau off and go down as it gets more, you know, as you get higher. So it doesn't seem to have as much impact on your actual income. Um, so, so all in all, I think e-commerce is the future of business. Uh, you know, everyone has a handheld device, everyone has, you know, a laptop, and we we can't stop those advancements from coming each year. Um, as e-commerce becomes more relevant in the market, especially in the pet industry, you have to be able to compete with those large companies in order to take your business to the next level. Uh, this project really helped me branch out uh, from the pet industry because I had to do a lot of research just into e-commerce in general, and it was really rewarding for me. And I hope that I can use this in the future as I continue to go through kind of business management positions. Meg, do you have any questions? 
I do. So I, that was really interesting, Bria. Um, could you talk a little bit about what you're currently doing um, out there and what your role is and maybe the, the integration of the skills that you learned through this and maybe what you hope to do in the future? Yeah, um, so I switched over into business, um, kind of like business management, um, and I had like a mix of finance and HR and data analysis, um, but what I was doing for the company as a business operations manager was really helping with payment processing integrations and um, the financials. So I had a lot of access to this kind of data where I could see revenue, I could see what factors were determining better revenue rates. Um, I actually did end up uh, leaving the company uh, about three weeks ago just to focus more on school because it was getting to be a bit much. Um, I'm not sure if I'll go back, the door is open. Um, but after doing this project, it has really shown me that I do kind of have a passion for this industry. I think it's something that will always be relevant in our lives. And uh, going forward, I would like to do more with payment processing itself, whether that be setting up the integrations or, um, you know, at my company, I did help implement two payment processors into our software. So that's kind of where I want to head is just continuing to learn um, the role payment processing plays for a business. That was great. Thank you very much. I think that you can probably, similar to what, um, to echo what Kevin said, I think that e-commerce is here to stay. I mean, I think that the, we are going to be lulled by the convenience of it, and I don't think we're going to want to give that up. So I think there's a place for you, for sure. Good luck. Um, Bria, I, that, was, that was a great presentation. Thank you. Um, a couple of points that struck me. I, I, I certainly, I wouldn't perhaps have related so closely or understood your your, your direction, if I didn't now, if I wasn't now visiting my son and, and his family uh, who just had a new baby. And when I'd been there, the Amazon Prime truck pulls up every day. <laughs> and I, you know, I bought maybe, I don't know, no more than 10 things from Amazon in my life. And, and they buy 10 things a week, as far as I can tell. So. So you're quite right about that. But, you know, going back to, to Kevin's uh, uh, presentation, the, the, the demographic issue has got to be pretty important. I mean, people like me, ancient people like me, you know, I don't know whether we're going to have time to catch up with, uh, with your generation. But um, it's certainly, I, I would think demographics enters into it. One thing that you said that, that I was interested in, you know, I think you said that email, that the consumers like email better than social media or respond to it more positively than social media, which reminded me that not so long ago, RIT was thinking, you know, students just don't pay attention to email. They want everything on social media, whatever the, you know, the, the modern platform is. And that, and that seems to fly in the face of what, what we've said. Has that changed? I mean, are people paying more attention to email now? You know, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I know I pay more attention to my email in the last like year or two than I ever have in my life. Um, but no, you make a good point. Uh, I think I think it's good to couple them. So what um, the study that I was looking at was more talking about social media engagements that are direct. So that would be kind of like messaging someone, getting in their uh, you know personal inbox, like someone messaged you to you on Facebook about their products. That's more intrusive than an email that just kind of advertises them or a social media post. Uh, so while I do think social media posts are very effective, uh, in the study that I was uh, kind of reading and analyzing, they were going for a more direct approach, which could contribute to the fact that um, the, the consumers who participated in said a study, only 25% you know, of them preferred to be contacted directly through social media rather than the 60% that preferred email. Let me ask you another question and then I'll shut up. Um, um, so I understand convenience. I mean, obviously convenience is, whatever the demographic is, convenience is always good. But one thing that I have not understood is the importance that people put now on timeliness. 
you know, I buy stuff off. Of, I don't buy it off Amazon, but I buy it off eBay. And oftentimes sellers will tell me, well, if you want it tomorrow, I can do it. And I, and I think I don't care about getting it tomorrow. I mean, I bought it. It, it can come next week or two weeks from now for all, I'm, all I care. So I, I wonder why you think timeliness has become such an, why does it have to be here tomorrow or yesterday? So I think that's a general generational thing. Um, I think especially, I, I would say millennials and younger, there's become this focus on instant gratification. Um, and, you know, I bought this laptop today. I want it now. Like I'm thinking about it now and I'm not going to stop thinking about it until I have it in my hand. Um, and I think that has come with the age of technology. You know, we used to sit in front of a TV and you sat through 10 minutes of commercials, but now we scream about a 15 second and skippable ad. Uh, and I think that kind of plays into the consumer market with younger generations is we're used to kind of having everything in the palm of our hand or shortly thereafter. And that's kind of where the timeliness comes in. Um, and I think large companies that can do the short shipping. I mean, I know when I lived in Los Angeles, Amazon, if I ordered something in the morning, they could be there by three in the afternoon because there's like eight Amazon hubs right in Los Angeles. Um, but I think they kind of, we've been conditioned as technology has advanced and can get things quicker that we want it now. So that's kind of where that comes from. I guess so. All right, uh, great presentation. Anybody else with any questions? I actually have one. Um, sure. Great, great presentation, Bria. That was, that was really cool. Um, <laughs> what I wanted to think, uh, know about is what you think about uh, companies like Chewy, um, where they're, they're just, all e-commerce now like do you think e-commerce is going to start um like replacing more storefront type models um with more people moving towards amazon and especially during covid everyone was just purchasing online um, what are your thoughts on that so uh i know personally we actually had a few um it's probably a small handful 20 or less out of our however many doors that we were servicing that didn't have a physical storefront. They actually just had like an inventory warehouse or their garage and they would sell stuff online to package and deliver. Um, I think it can really cut costs. I hate to say it, uh, but if you have a good e-commerce system and you just have your packagers and you know your management for that, it can cut a lot of costs that a physical storefront brings in. You no longer have you know, double rent if you need to store your inventory somewhere else. You no longer have to pay for a physical location. Um, I don't know if it's the future. I don't think people will ever stop shopping in public. And I think, um, you know, a lot of, I don't think it's actually the shopping itself. I think it's the social interaction that humans like. I know I sometimes just miss going out because it's something to do. Um, but I do think companies like Chewy and Amazon that are an entirely online marketplace, I, I do think they will continue to monopolize. Awesome, yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Of course, thanks. Other questions? Bria, uh, just, just quickly, Bria, thank you for the presentation, it was great. Um, I actually had the same kind of question that Peter had in terms of brick and mortar versus e-commerce. Anyway, I learned a lot about e-commerce and uh, the pet industry, and I just have one curiosity question. Where, where does the, I guess greatest portion of revenue come from in this in this e-commerce pet industry uh, area. Does it come from pet food, or is it other areas? Or I'm curious. Yes, um, is pet that the food. auto? Is that the auto ordering that you're referring to? Uh, so auto order can be done on any product. Uh, usually it is pet food though. So like if I have a dog and I you know I've had my dog for a couple of years and I know he goes through a five pound bag of food a month, I will just, if I find a store I like with a price I like, I'll just put it on an auto order each month. It gets delivered to my door or I go pick it up and I don't have to worry about thinking about it too much. Um, so that's auto ordering. But for what makes up this market, um, I'm trying to remember, I've looked at so many uh, stats. I believe pet food does lead by being about 42% of the market. Um, so that's usually where it comes in. But as luxury, you know, um, as people put more emphasis on their pets, um, we've kind of gotten into luxury pet goods. So now people are doing all raw natural diets that cost like $50 for two meals and 
all these different home care things and dressing up your dog and having the cutest Halloween costumes. <laughs> I think we're, it's starting to share more of the whole uh, retail market of, you know, luxury pet items are slowly climbing, but I think pet food will always be the highest because that's the bare minimum you can do for your pet. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. I don't have any question, but great job. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you too. Okay, I guess, uh, what time? Oh, oh, we managed to do it in two hours and 20 minutes. <laughs> I mean, one hour and 20 minutes. Okay, thanks everybody. Uh, three wonderful presentations. And uh, now, uh, like I always say, you can uh, focus on the two papers that you owe Meg and myself. And uh, anyway, great job. All three wonderful projects. And I uh, and, uh, hope uh, after you graduate, you're going to go on to even greater successes. Thanks very much. Uh, good luck Thank finishing you. out the rest of your semester. Stay safe, everybody. Fantastic job. Take care.